All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Charter Cities Institutes and African Infrastructure Development Association's Digital Rounds Table. These digital rounds tables seek to promote conversation and provide introductions among relevant stakeholders who are engaged in some facet of city development in Africa, including but not limited to investing, building, hosting, governing, and designing. Today's topic is building new cities in Africa, opportunities and challenges, and discussing it uh, are both members of CCI's Africa's Next 50 Cities Coalition, as well as other organizations who are interested in the conversation. We'll start with a round of introductions. I'm Carl Peterson, the Partnerships Manager for the Charter Cities Institute. When I call your name, please tell us who you are, your institution, and your role here. Curtis, I will go ahead and start with you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Carl. And, and before I go on introductions, Carl did a great job organizing and, and also just driving forward and getting the coalition up and running. So thanks, Carl. Um, I'm Curtis Lockhart. I'm executive director at the Charter Cities Institute. I think I've spoken to most of you, I believe. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, hi, uh, it's great. And uh, I'm looking forward to the roundtable. Thanks. Uh, Mwanda. Thank you, Carl. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you may be. My name is Mwanda Piri, African lead for the Charter Cities Institute, and I'm equally excited about this round table. Uh, Patrick and Nuria. Well, we're two people, so we'll go one at a time. Uh, I'm Patrick Lampson-Hall. Um, I'm uh, the principal urban planner at Fitted Projects, which is a member of the Next 50 Cities Coalition. It's an urban planning and design company. Um, I'm also an economist at the OECD um, and a fellow at New York University. And uh, I I gather that I'm here today to, to give the introductory presentation. Nuria? Yeah, the other partner of Fitted Projects. I'm the principal urban designer, so I take care of like doing putting all the ideas onto graphical documents that we can actually put at the uh, Coco. Let's see if her audio is connected. All right, well, we'll come back to uh, to Coco. Looks like she, she, oh, I see her now. Hi. Sorry, apologies for joining a few minutes late. So am I just introducing myself? Yeah, yeah just your yourself and, and your role at your organization. Hi, um, I'm Coco. Uh, I'm part of an organization called Itana. We're building a special economic zone in Nigeria uh, near Lagos, and uh, I'm the uh, COO of the company. Great. Uh, Dr. Darl. Uh, my name is Dal Uzu. Um, I'm the lead promoter for a new city in Nigeria. Enyimbai Economic City. Um, it's a, a project, a PPP project of the state government, private sector, and federal government of Nigeria. So um, I've, I'm very familiar with Cortis and uh, this is before now. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Nicholas. Sure, my name is Nicholas Anzinger, not Kara Isabella. I, my laptop had a damage yesterday, so I had to switch to my wife's laptop. Um, Nicholas Anzinger, I'm the general partner of Infinita, a venture capital fund that's looking to invest in tech startups that use special economic zones as launch pads. Awesome. Uh, Nick, Alan? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nick Allen. I'm the managing partner of the Savant Venture Fund is a deep tech and hardware fund based in Cape Town, but with an interest in, in the continent. Uh, I see a good alignment with the kind of hardware business and deep tech businesses that we invest in and uh, this initiative. So that's what I'm here for. Awesome. Uh, Kevin. Great. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Kevin Nelson. I'm the urban governance lead at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I sit within our Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance Bureau. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a first conversation with Carl about, about this effort and looking to, to align our interests and in equities in, uh, in Africa. Thanks. Over. Awesome. Uh, Tony. 
Hi, um, good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, <laughs> Tony Okoye, um, architect and designer week, week Kensler. Um, I'm a partner and I sit in the DC office, um, but we're a global design firm looking um, to in increase our participation on the continent. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for having me and um, happy to meet all of you. Awesome. Uh, Richard. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard. I'm from Razi. We're a market intelligence uh, platform. We basically enable businesses looking to scale in emerging markets in Africa, South America, and Asia uh, by providing access to data. Um, and also, we're part of the 50 Cities Coalition. And my role is to oversee operations within the African market. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, is Corey here? All right. Looks like Corey hasn't made it. Uh, Kenneth. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenneth Nyasada from Kenya, working with the Department for Housing and Urban Development on issues infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patson. Hello. Yes, I'm Patson Piri. I'm an assistant director in the Department of Fiscal Planning. I'm an urban planner uh, in the uh, Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development in Zambia. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Uh, and then uh, Julia. Hello. Um, I'm part of Coco's team at Itana. Um, so thanks for letting me join and listen in. Awesome. And Fiona. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Fiona Jerry. I'm a civil engineer from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Kenya. I'm happy to join you. Awesome. And have I missed anyone? Should, should I introduce myself? Well, Vivek. Yeah. Oh, Vivek. Yes, please. Uh, thanks. How thanks can I do much. that, Vivek? Gosh. Well, no, it's, a, it's absolutely fine. Um, hey, if, uh, good good afternoon or good morning to those those joining from the US. Um, I'm Vivek Mittal. I run uh, Africa Infrastructure Development Association. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, of the private sector led infrastructure sector in Africa. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later about what our angle is, but super excited about. Uh, combining uh, the, the efforts in, in, of infrastructure with, with urban development, uh, astute, clever, foresightful urban development in Africa. Well, can I maybe, Carl, before we dive into things, I'll just piggyback off of what Vivek said, because I'm sure most or not, if not all of you have received uh, uh, an invitation from some CCI or to our Africa's New Cities Summit in Kigali, Rwanda, in November 16th to 18th. I see heads nodding, so that's good. Um, I wanted to highlight after Vivek talked, so sure there'll be a bunch of panels. I, some of you are gonna be on some of those panels. There'll be a bunch of presentations and speakers. Um, the, the main thing we wanna highlight is new city builders themselves, the challenges they, they've faced, um, the lessons they've learned so that other new city builders don't have to make the same mistakes there can be quick feedback loops and, and learning. And I think that's been really missing in the space. That's one of the key things that the Next 50 Cities Found uh, Coalition wants to do. Um, but also in addition to those panels, presentations, learnings, there'll be another segment to the summit uh, called the New Cities Accelerator Catapult that uh, Vivek and his team at the Africa Infrastructure Development Association are gonna lead. They have uh, this catapult program attached to a bunch of other infrastructure um, conferences and events across the continent, and the association has um, a, a great list of infrastructure financiers and builders across the continent as as members. So uh, we're really happy to partner with Vivek and his team on uh, on the summit. So with that, I'll I'll shut up and pass it back to Carl. <laughs> great. Hey, Carl. Uh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, my name is Gaius. Uh, I'm found with the Bridge Consortium, um, Zambian company, and we are building a new city um, that includes a farm city as well. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, fantastic. And I guess one last time, have I missed anyone? 
Great. In that case, Patrick, I'll hand it over to you for the presentation. Great. Uh, well, I'd just like to start by uh, saying this is a really amazing group of people to have together. And um, <clears throat> I really applaud the efforts of the Charter Cities Institute to bring together all the people who are trying to take action in this space. Um, it's especially gratifying to see people who are attracting businesses to <clears throat> new zones and charter cities, which is something that I think uh, is often kind of taken for granted by people who are operating more on the academic side of the space. So as I said earlier, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I have a bit of a frog in my throat, just a sec. <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah, air conditioning, terrible stuff. Uh, so as I, as I said earlier, I'm Patrick Lampson Hall, and uh, I'm going to give um, an introductory kind of framing presentation <clears throat> based on research that I've done in various roles and that I've done collaboratively on uh, urbanization and uh, tendencies in urban development in Africa. Um, then the presentation is going to talk a bit about the opportunities for charter city and new city development, the implications of the data. And it will conclude with some recommendations based on projects that Nuri and I have worked on together um, involving simplified frameworks for rapidly scaling up new city development, improving uh, the orderliness of it, and ultimately using new city and charter city development to, uh, to make urbanization deliver a greater dividend in the place where it's happening fastest, which is Africa. So let me load my presentation up here. Just take me a second. Looking good? Great. It's good. <clears throat> so we come to this topic of uh, charter cities in Africa at a time when Africa is experiencing the most rapid urban growth of any region in the world. Um, between uh, 1990 and uh, 2020, the continent added around 400 million, sorry, between 2000 and 2020, the continent added around 400 million new urban residents. And the number is actually on track to double uh, between 2025 and 2050, uh, 800 million new urban residents moving to cities in Africa in the next 25 years. Um, so for those of you who are interested in this from the for-profit side, you could say that's the, that's the size of your market and it's truly, it's an enormous market. Uh, in comparison to other world regions, Africa is going to add twice as many, the, the urban population is growing twice as fast as in other world regions. The total population is growing twice as fast as in other world regions. Um, but when we think about urbanization in Africa, we have to keep in mind that this, in some sense, is a time-limited phenomenon. So in general, countries stop urbanizing when they reach 75 to 80% urban. And in Africa, that will happen in less than two generations. So this is really a window of time when we can have a really uh, enormous impact on how urban growth happens. And the form of cities is sticky. It's something that stays around in the long term. So getting this urbanization right is, is really quite critical. Um, we see some trends as Africa is urbanizing. So uh, measuring the scope of urbanization in Africa is something that's rather difficult. I've lately been working with and supporting the development of a database called Africa Polis, um, which defines urban settlements on the basis of their, their physical contiguity. And I won't go into that too much, but it, it gives estimates of urbanization that are slightly higher than the norm. Um, and according to that database, Africa is actually 50% urban as of 2020, meaning 50% of the population is living in settlements of 10,000 people or more. Another interesting thing that we see is this tendency of urbanization isn't just occurring in existing cities, it's also occurring through the emergence of new cities and not the kinds of new cities that we're used to thinking about, which are new cities that are built from scratch. This is a phenomenon that has been incompletely studied, but it's called in situ urbanization, where a small village uh, or a town adds population and reaches the status of an urban settlement. And we see this occurring at great scale. Between 2015 and 2020, um, 
we're estimating here at the OECD that Africa added about 1,100 new urban settlements with 10,000 people or more, places that grew up to cross that threshold. And the average size is about 15,500. Now, 90% of the population in Africa is living within 25 kilometers of a small city. Um, and these emerging settlements give the best market access. Uh, the, the graphics here, the one on the right is based on um, research that my team did that actually mapped the emergence of new urban settlements from 1950 to 2015. And uh, in this data, it found a 2000% increase in the urban population and a tenfold increase in the number of urban settlements in Africa from 1950 to 2015. So new settlement formation is actually a common phenomenon. And uh, a major driver of this new settlement formation is rural to urban migration, a phenomenon that we're already familiar with. And when we look at the geographic distribution of these settlements, we see that um, they, they tend to cluster near existing municipalities, existing metropolitan areas. So in one sense, we're seeing urbanization, but in another sense, we're seeing metropolitanization in Africa. Um, it's not occurring massively in rural areas, although there is some of that, some of that emergence taking place. Uh, when we look at the numbers over time, I don't wanna get too boring with this. I'll just give the, the headline. The, the headline here is that uh, opportunity from the perspective of investing in urban development lives in small places that are near large places. Uh, increasing shares of the population are living in large settlements. At the same time, we see, as I was saying, a huge proliferation of, of small settlements that are that are near those large settlements. So while the absolute number of, of really big places hasn't increased that much in the last 50 years, the absolute number of really, really small places has increased a lot. There are 10 times more small cities now than there were in 1950. Um, so this, this is where a lot of growth is occurring. 54% of total urban growth occurring in secondary cities between 1990 and 2010. Um, so to say it again, opportunity really lives in small places. And partly that's about the geography of where growth is occurring. But also it's because when we look at the emergence of these small settlements in larger metropolitan areas, it's the small settlements where it's actually possible to do business. These are the places where you can buy land. These are the places where you have an opportunity to influence policy. These are the places where you can obtain corridors for infrastructure. You can actually work with the government and where there's a real demand for investment versus working in larger cities where the opportunities are potentially a, a bit more obvious, but the scope for growth is a bit is a bit reduced relatively. Now, this is probably no surprise to anyone, but as these cities are growing in population, they're also expanding in area. We have this example here of Accra in Ghana, which between 1991 and 2014 tripled in population, increased sixfold in area. So that means that over time, and this is what we see around the world, but, but also in Africa, over time, land consumption is increasing on a per capita basis. So when we look at long-term urban trends, we have to anticipate the idea that in the future, as people become wealthier, they're going to consume more land than they are today on a per person basis. And again, this, this represents a, a business opportunity because that land needs to be planned and organized for settlement. Uh, we can also see it reflected in statistics on expansion and densification. In, in my field, in the urban field, there's a lot of debate about whether cities should grow primarily through expansion or through densification. And when we look at the numbers, what we see is three quarters of the population growth in urban areas is taking place in new greenfield development. This isn't necessarily contiguous. It includes satellite cities, small and emerging urban settlements, and contiguous greenfield growth, urban expansion, and only a quarter is taking place through densification. And partly that's due to the magnitude of the growth. So if you're a city that's tripling in population, it's very hard to accommodate all of that population growth within your existing area through densification. So urban expansion in some sense is an inevitable consequence. And most of the growth that happens will happen in peripheral areas in the next three decades. 
I'm not saying this is a kind of policy preference. It's more in the mode of kind of a fact based on a trend. So this matters because uh, for cities to actually deliver, they have to function well as labor markets. And uh, labor markets in a general sense are places where people can connect, places where people can learn from each other, places where people can share inputs, supply chains and infrastructure, and places where people can connect with the opportunities that actually enable them to achieve their fullest potential or in an economic sense, their greatest productivity. But labor markets only function well when cities are integrated, when they actually are developed in a, in a planned manner. And that's because in a general sense, labor markets are a metropolitan phenomenon. So these three examples are from the States, but there are others from, from around the world and what we see is even when we think of a city as having a downtown, when we think of a city as having a center, when we track commuting patterns like we did in Chicago and Atlanta, we can see that uh, people live and work throughout the area of the city and the productivity of the city, the amount of money that people can earn per person or that firms can earn per customer is based on the strength of those connections. The larger the market is, the more transactions there will be, the more competition there will be, and the better the system will function. And we can see this as well when we map firms within an industry. So, you know, you would think that Silicon Valley is a, is a valley that's concentrated in San Jose, but it's not. Tech firms are shown here as blue dots, and they're distributed throughout the commuting area of the San Francisco, Oakland, California, San Jose area. And you can demonstrate this in a number of different firms. So we, we have to think about cities as integrated metropolitan labor markets. Now, in Africa, this is a problem because the growth that's taking place is taking place without the kind of connective infrastructure that lets these labor markets actually function well. Especially in larger cities, it can be difficult, and many of you know this, it can be difficult or impossible to move from one side of the city to another. And much of the development that's taking place is taking place in a really chaotic manner without the reservations of space that are required to put connective infrastructure in. Now, this is very costly, but I was asked as well to think about the opportunities for charter city development that emerge from these trends. There's an obvious opportunity here. If you're able to establish connective infrastructure in a city before development happens, say, if you go to a small place, you buy a lot of land, you secure corridors for infrastructure and you put it in, you can build a center that's much more productive than the average that's emerging in African cities. So there's, there's a big opportunity there. Um, and this is actually an interesting opportunity because uh, what ultimately determines the value of land in cities is its connectivity. So how productive that land becomes and how well connected it is, that's what drives land value. I don't know guys if that's too uh, overtly capitalistic of me, but uh, I, I, perhaps it's a friendly audience in that regard. Now, the problem is most of the private sector development that's happening around new cities uh, is really failing to meet the need here. So I, I just have a couple of examples, uh, which we've been leaning on a lot lately. Um, we have Kalamba in Rwanda and Angola. And then we have this place called Barrio Rangel, which is also in Rwanda and Angola. And Kalamba was a, a purpose-built city. Um, it's a city that was built from scratch and it was intended to be a, a kind of a planned new development. And Barrio Rangel is an informal settlement that developed piecemeal uh, over a large period of time. And um, when, we, when we look at these, two places, you know, we can see that there's a massive opportunity created by the gap between them. So um, formal growth, like we see in Kalamba, which is on the left here, produces cities that have infrastructure. It produces cities that have quality accommodations in some cases, cities that, uh, that have customers, that have an economic base. Um, but they only apply to a relatively small portion of the population. In, uh, in the case of Kalamba, no more than 5% of the population of Angola can afford to live in the units that are on offer in Kalamba. It's a very, very, very expensive place given the level of development in the country and in the city. 
Now, Barrio Rangel is a place that's widely accessible. It's accessible to, to people all up and down the income ladder. And unlike in Colombo, it's a place where people can have a mix of uses, a place where they can really actually build their businesses, where they can really actually develop their own homes. And, uh, and, uh, and it's a place that really responds to their needs, but it lacks infrastructure and public services. So um, what we need, you know, what we can see is kind of the emergent need when we look at uh, what cities need to accomplish in the global South and in Africa in general, given this evidence and data, is we need cities that can handle rapid urban growth, meaning it can take 20 years to build a city for 100,000 people. It has to be able to scale quickly, scale as quickly as an informal settlement scales or close. Um, if we wanna actually address the trend that's occurring, if we wanna actually be market maximizing, then we need cities that are designed for the people who are actually living in African cities. That's a range of people, the emergent middle class, migrants, people who've been displaced, low-income locals, domestic entrepreneurs. We need, we need cities that respond to the mix of incomes that actually exists in Africa. We need cities that have public goods. They have infrastructure. They have roads, water pipes. They have electricity. They have parks. And we need cities that actually react well to the true economic development opportunities that exist in Africa, um, that aren't simply you know, fetishizing a foreign investment-driven export-oriented model, which given other constraints in the region are, uh, is unlikely to produce broad-based prosperity. So what do we do? Well, one of the first things that we need to do uh, is we need to, um, we need to be sure that we can act quickly. And if we wanna act quickly, that means that we need pretty simple development approaches. And I, I really think of this as a market maximizing strategy. So many of the new cities that are being purpose-built, charter cities that are being purpose-built, um, are aiming at a very, very small globalized income segment, or they're aiming at the little portion of the economy that is occupied by uh, foreign export-focused businesses. I say this is thinking very, very small. You'll, you'll do much better if you come up with ways to address the needs of the mass population. And if you can do that, if you can actually improve the offerings in the markets and peripheral areas, and Nuri and I have done some amazing projects in Latin America that look at uh, that actually have succeeded in doing exactly that. Um, if you can build a mass market product that's orderly, and that offers opportunities for growth, the market is yours, really. No one, no one is really even trying to do it. Um, but that's what the challenge should be. That's where the private sector can step in. So I, I'm gonna, uh, I just wanna check in really quickly with Carl. How, how am I doing on time? You good? Uh, you are doing okay, uh, another five minutes or so, if that's okay for you. Five minutes, man, this guy's brutal. No, yeah, no problem. But... Five minutes is great. Five minutes is great. You told me how long it would be. I just didn't set a clock when I started. Um, so I'll just I'll just take a brief moment and uh, be a very nerdy urban planner because I know we have a few here. So uh, the work that Nuri and I have done at Fitted Projects is is focused on how how do you actually do this? Like how do you actually implement these ideas? Um, so the first thing that we recommend is go getting back to the grid. Um, the grid is a, a very simple way of organizing space. It consumes relatively little land. You know, a grid of 30 meter wide arterial roads that can carry public transportation, water, power, that can carry bicycles and scooters and trucks. Um, if you space it one kilometer by one kilometer, it only takes up 6% of the land. It's a really, really lightweight planning methodology. And you can work that out on paper. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the truth. Um, so start with the grid, divide into arterial blocks, subdivide, subdivide, and create neighborhoods on the basis of a grid. Now, what I like about a grid and why we advocate for grids is the economy and the society in African cities is changing very, very rapidly. Household sizes are falling, industries are diversifying, connectivity is improving to international markets, um, access to telecommunications is changing, the preferences of consumers are changing, you need to have an urban plan that isn't completely predicated on things staying the way that they are now. You need an urban plan that can be as adaptive as the plan of Barcelona or New York, cities that have undergone incredible changes over the decades. So that's what we need in, in a place that's rapidly growing. Um, get the scale right. So uh, I, I think of this as like uh, simple subdivisions and then scale them for informality. So do, do your planning at a scale that 
actually acknowledges the kinds of economic activities that are commonly occurring. Um, that means having room for informal vendors. It means having room for the 90% of the population that gets around on foot uh, or on public transportation, on bicycle. It means not prioritizing cars. You can build communities that will be the most walkable places and that will drive increases in value while also making room for mass market participation. Um, and to a large extent, accessibility starts by having plots, individual plots available for purchase and construction that, that match the, the scale that's being applied in the informal sector. Because it's very easy, this is where I get too nerdy, you can talk to me after this if you want. Um, it's very easy to combine plots, but it's very hard to subdivide plots once they're already created. So if you want to build a development that's actually inclusive, you have to start with the smallest plots that you can get away with. And rather than contracting one big developer to do your build out on the site, make these plots available to people. You know, the, the most effective market for providing housing and providing commercial real estate in Africa is the informal market. We have to mirror the informal market tendencies of small plots that are widely available, incremental development that's done by individual households and firms, small firms, but we have to compensate for the failures of the informal sector. That's what we do if we want to do something more than boutique projects that cater to the elite. That that's how we have to do it. And the and the dorky urban planning part of it is, is this is how you do it. And that, that's what we do at Fitted Projects, just to be a commercial. Um, along with that, and implicit in what I'm saying is we have to leverage informality. We can't see informality as a negative externality of urbanization. We have to see informality for what it is. Informality is an expression of the spirit of entrepreneurship. And we also have to understand that informality is how most people, anyone who lives, who lives in Africa knows this, how most people in most places get most of their needs met. And it represents the majority of the economic activity by far. And the idea here is if you're designing a zone where you have control over the regulations, write those regulations in a way where informal businesses aren't informal businesses. So where someone who is who's starting small business, who wants to start a small business with low capital can, and it's actually something that's okay and they can get insurance and they can live their life and they can build their business. And if you do that, what you're going to do is unleash creativity and let people build the cities that they're going to inhabit instead of keeping the informal sector on the margins of the development process. There's gonna be massive upside. Whoever does this is gonna get massive upside just from letting people do the things that they're already doing and making it legal. That's, that's the truth. Because the development process in Africa is completely stifled by inappropriate regulations. And that, is the opportunity that's represented in charter cities in that regard. I'm almost done, guys. Um, when you're designing your place, you're building your place, you're setting up your government's, governance structure, make sure that you organize it in a way where you can have a virtuous cycle of investment and growth. Now, what that means is whatever entity is controlling the development has to have an incentive to do two things. The first thing is they have to have an incentive to put in public goods at a level that matches the development that's actually occurring. So if you build a freeway that looks like it belongs in California in a development that's designed for lower middle class people in Rwanda, you're going to go bankrupt. So you have to have an incentive to match your infrastructure to the development level that you're operating in. And then the second thing you have to do is have an incentive to upgrade it over time. So as people become wealthier, you have to have a way to capture the increase in land value and reinvest it in better infrastructure. But you have to see the infrastructure development process as a process of creating public goods that, that is incremental and evolutionary. Now, the one thing that you can't skip is securing the corridors for the infrastructure before the development happens. So uh, a major part of the function of a, of a formal developer in this context is to do that, make sure that the land for the roads is reserved before development happens, because otherwise you end up with a scenario like we have on the left, where you're trying to open up a road to bring in water and power and connectivity to an area that's already been constructed, and that's a mess. It's a disaster. So private sector developers can sidestep that to some extent. The public sector can too. Um, second to last slide. We have to avoid being too prescriptive. Don't try to control everything. Let land and housing markets develop organically. Because as I mentioned earlier, 
these economies and societies are rapidly evolving. It looks more like the US or Europe in the 1800s, where the per capita GDP and even the household formation styles that we're gonna see in 50 years bear very little resemblance to the way that they look now. We have to treat it like it's something that we, that we expect to change, that we expect to evolve. So what we see on the left is a cartoon by the great cartoonist R. Crumb. It's called The Short History of America. And it shows how a piece of land goes from being a forest to being, well, a kind of a utopia. But what I, what I, the reason why I like to show this is because it shows you how rapidly things can change and how things can change. And on the right, you can see our very nerdy plannery representation of this same idea. We're seeing the same block over about a 30 year time period if you allow the uses to evolve in response to demand and changes in the economy. So, um, so we can't, treat these new places in Africa like they're very late in a development process. We can't treat it like it's a fixed state. Um, uh, we have to be much more flexible with our, with our rules about what's allowed to happen. Um, otherwise, we leave a lot of money on the table and we can really stifle the development process. But if we let that occur, then we can, we can see some real interesting organic, um, organic local economic development that occurs, endogenous growth. So concluding slide. Um, what can we do here? How do we fill the gap where we have, in some places, as much as 90% of new development is informal, um, where uh, the new cities that are being built are often targeting higher income, export-oriented sectors. So what we need to do is use the, the capital that's made available in new city projects to address the shortage of developable land in existing labor markets. We have to understand that that's a big part of what we're doing. We're addressing a shortage of connected developable land. The cities that get built, they have to be designed for long-term growth by making it very simple. We have to recognize the value of the economic activities that are already occurring and find opportunities to build on the creative energy that that represents. And this in the long run, it was demonstrated by the economist Paul Romer. In, in the long run, that is a better economic strategy than focusing on attracting industries and brains from outside. Um, it gets you further in the long run. Um, we have to understand public goods and infrastructure as something that we build over time in parallel with other development processes, not as a one-time investment that we make. And finally, we let the land and housing markets develop organically. We avoid being overly prescriptive in how we want our cities to look and what we want to have happen there. And what you get at the end of it is you get an enormous increment on the value of the land because you create places that actually work economically. They're not enclaves, they have a mass market, high demand, um, and they function well. So this is my presentation. Thank you. Awesome, Patrick, that was really great. Um, we appreciate it. I think what I'd like to do now is um, open up the floor for, for some discussion. I'll go ahead and start. Vivek has asked a few questions. Um, my favorite question that, that Vivek has asked and that, you know, I, I sort of get a lot, you know, Patrick, what comes first, the city or the jobs? Um, so, you know, what kind of anchors does a successful city development need? How do you think about this? Yeah, great question. Um, really, really great question, Vivek. Thanks. So um, it's really expensive to create a labor market from scratch. Uh, it's more than you want to spend. So the, the good move, in my opinion, is to find a place that's near an existing labor market, an existing city of some kind, and, and leverage that. And if you, if you want to be really smart about it, you look for a place that has an international airport or a harbor, because the cost of building those things is, is more, you'll, you'll never recoup the cost of doing that unless your project is enormous and you're, you're looking at a 30-year return timeline. But on like a normal seven to 10 year return timeline, you need to be near a place that already has jobs and you need to be near a place that already has uh, the, the infrastructure that you're gonna need. Um, and you, you build on the outskirts. So, so most new cities that can succeed need to be near existing cities. Uh, it looks like Kevin has a question. Yeah, actually, first I have a comment, then then a question. Um, Patrick, thanks thanks for that great presentation uh, about the labor markets. One one thing, and I, I think maybe Carl and I and colleagues when we we met a few weeks ago talked a little bit about this. But uh, before the unrest in Tigray in Ethiopia, 
USAID, we were working with um, the government there about, there were, I don't know, maybe 20 or 22 industrial parks that the, that the national government was looking to, to sort of um, invest in, in terms of building out kind of, not exactly new towns, but just identifying that, that these industrial parks can be sort of, you know, kind of tent poles for additional development in creating, you know, more 24 hour cities versus, you know, what, what I think they were seeing was the cost of, you know, moving people and probably goods to these, these parks, you know, having, having work happen there and then, you know, the cost of, you know, transporting people out. So kind of more formalizing those. So I think that's, that's potentially a model just in terms of kind of where some of the current investment is happening, at least from, you know, from that standpoint of like developing around labor. Um, it, and that, like I said, it, it, we've invested in it, but because of the variety of factors have kind of, kind of moved away. Um, but I know that there's still interest there at our mission uh, in terms of uh, assisting the government there. So that's one example. But the more, more in terms of a question, and, and maybe this, this can just be for, for future, but um, I, I really did like the discussion about, um, you know, the kind of that dichotomy with the informal settlements and how, you know, trying to, um, you know, trying to bring, you know, informal settlements along into the, uh, into the market. However, I'm just a little, I, I can't quite get my head around how to do that with keeping that informality as you described, but doing it in a way that makes it more formal, because that's one of the biggest issues that or barriers that we at USAID we kind of get into in terms of um, settlements and, and the work that we do in Africa is that with so many informal settlements, it really is about that ratepayer and transferring people from, you know, the the um, contacts that they have, and then moving that along, you know, moving those residents along to something formalized. And there is an appreciation of having that informality because they're, you know, they're not rate payers. They're not, you know, they don't own property. And that, you know, ha that, that is a, a really difficult thing that we find in trying to unlock that to move people along from, you know, not owning property to doing so and then being part of that engine that creates that, uh, you know, that, you know, those tax dollars, and then creates the investment into additional infrastructure. So, I mean, we've been we've been working at this for you know quite a bit with you know some success, but not as much as I would like to see. So, it, I'm, I'm curious, you know, where the successes are in. Uh, I'd love to speak to to both those models. Parts. So, sorry, I know that was a long. No, no worries, no worries. I think it's a good question. So, I think that there's often. Um, a misconception about informal settlements. And I, by no means am I trying to say that you have it because I, I know you're an expert in the field, but um, right. the, the, the misconception is that people in informal settlements don't pay. And you know the, the reality is that uh, living in an informal settlement is much more expensive than living in a formal settlement. So when, when we think about these people as participants in the economy, you know they're paying three to five times more for water, they're paying sometimes twice as much for food. They're paying massive amounts of rent, which often ends up in the pockets of local mafias. It's um, it, they're they're in the economy, but the fact that right. their activities are prohibited means that they don't have access to a few things that we want them to have. So, and when I think about formalizing formality, I, I think of it in really really okay, simple terms. So, um, like, if you were, yeah. Yeah. Patrick, I think I think you're uh, right, I, I, and and I don't. I don't mean we don't need to have a, a deep dive into this, but I but no, no, I do, I, but I do I, I think you're I think you're right in in many aspects of that. But I think what what we see in terms of the governments that we're working in is that yeah. we know that there's there's a, an incredible amount of leakage in terms of you know that economic act that economic activity that's happening. And like you said, yes, the you know residents are you know. Kind of per you know per capita paying so much more for you know for water based on you know the the um, you know the the systems that are in place, but they're they're also we we you know we have evidence of so many people that that are not you know don't have a land title or don't want to have a land title because they yeah. 
they fear, you know, getting plugged into a more formalized. Let, let me just let me just briefly finish the. I, I was yeah. I was mid point. Um, so right. the, thing, the things that I think people need um, personally, when I when I think about what can happen in new cities and charter cities for informal people, is um, allowing incremental construction of buildings. This is something that is hugely important. So changing changing the building approval and permitting process in a way that lets people who don't have access to capital build. Um, along with that, giving people security of tenure. So uh, yeah. in, a, in a de facto way, even if you're a renter, you know, I'm not even proposing that people have to own, just having, just having security of tenure mm -hmm. in that regard. And then simplifying business, uh, uh, business registration requirements so that people who have informal sector businesses aren't necessarily subjected to, to predatory third parties, you know, that they're actually right. able to appeal for protection. And, uh, and maybe one more thing that goes with the first two, um, being able to get proper connections to water and power. So mm -hmm. if you can do those things, then you can take a large portion of the population and you, you, you might not make them formal outside your zone. Like they might still be too low income to meet the legal requirements for formality and housing and business operation outside your special zone. But within your zone, you're going to undo most of the negative externalities that come from informality. And, and that's, that's kind of what I'd like to see. Yeah, uh, same. Same here. I think Coco has something that she would like to ask. Oh, sorry. Oh no, just um, as you guys are talking about this topic, um, I was wondering if we can zoom in to any, or if you know of any specific examples in regards to effective policy or regulations or the urban planning uh, law or rules that you've mentioned in any specific corners of the world that we can sort of look at. Yeah, th this has been done really extensively in Tanzania. It was done a lot in Zambia in the past. Um, and for a long time, it was a real pillar of the development strategies in um, Thailand. Um, and I, I think it's been done in other places. And the process that you go through is a kind of a general process of upgrading and registration, but also a loosening of requirements. There was a great paper that came out that, that really looked at the, the housing and urban development side of this. Um, where they put in rules that allowed people to do incremental building, but they also provided them with access to infrastructure. And in many of the neighborhoods that they, that received the access to infrastructure, you know, they looked at it ten years after starting the project, and they said that the the, the project had failed because the places looked like slums. Then they came back twenty years after that, and they wrote a paper called "Success When We Deemed It Failure," and the the point of that paper is by giving people nothing except basic infrastructure connections and the right to build on their on the land that they had secured, they initiated a virtuous cycle of incremental growth that eventually led to those neighborhoods becoming like becoming not slum neighborhoods. So that that's something that, yeah, we, we know that that can happen. Like we know that that can work. Ah, Chinese urban village is another great example. Yeah, exactly. So places that uh, became enormously economically productive, um, kind of on the basis of of being being allowed to move through stages of development. Carl, we have a question from Vivek. Yeah, I mean Vivek, I think you you'd like to to discuss kind of the catapult, correct? Um, if if if, I'm, if if Patrick is done with his excellent, uh, uh, I'm not going to go just now, but I'll have to leave I'm, in two minutes. I'm I'm happy to be done. I think uh, I I really appreciate everyone's attention and questions, and uh, you know, just to close by saying, um, the the informality topic is a sticky one, um, and I'm always happy to continue discussing it because I think the solution through it is by no means clear. Um, but thank you, thank you everyone for for your attention, and happy to answer further questions offline if anyone has any. Right. Uh, should I should I go on on? Kind yeah, of... please, please go ahead, Vivek. Okay. So, <laughs> my apologies. I have a I have a bad cough that uh, struggling to leave me, but uh, um, so I'll try and keep it brief. As 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 an infrastructure association, we we are struggling with how to create scale and speed. And for the best part of the last 30, 40 years the way of financing infrastructure, particularly with private capital, and whether it's in a PPP configuration or a 
straight private sector is to is to have government agencies underwrite uh, the revenue and then back that up with, with government guarantees and then further back that up with uh, world bank uh, uh, world world bank or mego or some such like mitigation and that that is not working what we find is that actually uh, the the skills and the and the resources that need to come together for large scale infrastructure that takes too much time and there's this perennial gap in infrastructure so you know the informal informal uh, uh, sector that that uh, Pat, uh, Patrick was talking about earlier uh, that just keeps expanding and so we've been thinking about how best to uh, to deal with that now if you look at sp speed scale security of investment quality of infrastructure um, none of that works if you get this if you don't get the speed right so so that resulted about a year and a half back for us to create something called the catapult accelerator for uh, for uh, really private sector capacity building on the continent i e there's a lot of dependence on capital and capability from outside Africa to get any form of infra whether it's a solar simple solar <laughs> Whether it's a simple solar project, a hospital, or or a school, or any, anything like that, requires international capability and capital. Um, and the cap the catapult accelerator which we've held so far, we've had startups from the continent and clean energy coming, but scale is missing. And 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 so the dynamics of scale. So we were very delighted to hear. And and the other big dynamic that's taking place in Africa. Uh, when we talk about investments, governments are starting to say, hey, we don't want to just be exporting our raw materials, our minerals, our uh, our, our agriculture, our, our uh, um, oil and gas energy reserves. Uh, we want that to be beneficiated. <laughs> Very sorry. Um, beneficiated in some way, shape or form on the continent. So there's talk about industrial parks at scale, and there are a few. There are quite a few that are going at, at breakneck speed. So if you look at agility, if you look at Arise, IIP, etc. <laughs> but actually, cities are where all of this comes together. A city on its own is an accelerator, an incubator by its very nature. And and we were very delighted that actually it was it was Curtis and John's idea to to engage on this <clears throat> and very delighted to be working together on this is so the whole point of the catapult is um you know we do quite a lot of advocacy work all of you are doing quite a lot of advocacy work in in your respective fields but that doesn't translate into action so the you see, the accelerator we created for infrastructure uh is designed to bring in projects and startups <clears throat> and give them support on on four fronts all the way through to from concept to financial close and that is that is the idea that Curtis and I and you know have have cooked together that in addition to bringing stakeholders together in Kigali to to discuss uh, how the, the the hows and whys and and, and what's of uh, urban development, new cities development in Africa? Why don't we? Why don't we use that opportunity to launch an incubation for five, three to five cities across the continent at scale? Um, uh, because then, and and that that will bring all the different talents that require. That require. That should that should be the sort of uh, honeypot that all, all you know uh, contractors, equipment suppliers. Uh, in manufacturing companies, you know the the the, the um, gaps of this world and the Nikes of this world should come around to, along with smartphone manufacturers, etc. Um, and and that is that is a suggestion over here. So I would, would welcome any comments or thoughts or questions in this regard. Whether this whether the group feel that this is this is too big to to tackle right now, it should just be discussion, or whether there is merit in taking this forward. Um, Curtis, please feel free to add anything that you think is relevant that I may have missed out. No, thanks so much, Vivek. I think you you 
covered it. I, I think, you know, in there's a lot of Next 50 Cities coalition members here on the chat today, and there's many, many more. Uh, and I think several of them come to mind as potential uh, catapult members and, and whatnot, and potentially being uh, the ones to uh, come to Kigali and pitch and present their projects to, you know, a panel of um, kind of distinguished folks that can give them uh, tips and tricks and and um, pointers early on. And I think one thing to to point out and maybe speak to a little more, Vivek, is uh, a lot of at least our projects in our network are in different stages of development, right? So like, for example, I think I was just talking to Dr. Darl before everyone got on the call. Animba, you know, huge congratulations is reaching financial close after a long um, due diligence period uh, in the next month or two months. Uh, whereas, for example, Bridge Consortium, so Gaius King and his team are a little earlier on in, in, in the stage, right? And so does Catapult, or at least how you've structured it in, in the past, does it speak to these different stages of the project life cycle? Do you accept projects from all different stages? Maybe talk to that a little more. Absolutely. Uh, look, I mean, peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is a big part of this. And the reason we are suggesting... Uh, I mean, the uh, so, so a feeder is a collaborative effort. <clears throat> and the, the essence of collaboration is that people with different skill sets, different different experiences come together and, and shake out what is workable in each case. Um, so, so we've had, amongst the six who went first time last year in Cape Town, um, we had folks who had all the capital lined up, they didn't really need to be there. But the reason we put them up there is because they're doing something really innovative in terms of uh, in terms of the commercial and financing structures. Um, and they require all the support of the industry to get that right. We also had very early stage companies that actually uh, had, uh, you know, we're just thinking of, and they, they didn't get their cost of debt and cost of capital right, even in their discussion and their 10-minute pitch. Um, so, but then they learned, and, and the whole point is to accelerate. So eventually everybody will learn. These are smart people who come together to, to do these projects and they'll figure their path. But the question is, can we help them squeeze their, their learning in a way that, that gets them over the line quicker with a surer outcome? So all stages are welcome in, in, in uh, you know, projects and developers at, at every stage of development are welcome to be part of this. It is more the attitude of the, of the team, the, the, the willingness of the team to roll up their sleeves and get behind all the tough questions uh, is is what we're looking for as as an entry point into the into the system, and really what that creates is you know I mean what we haven't talked so far and be good to hear the role of governments the political will to get this right is hugely important. Um, it is for infrastructure for sure in my sector. But I expect in getting, you know, getting all the policies set up, allowing for investments in the context of cities, it is as well. Now, we we have a lot of discussion with uh, uh, ministries of finance, with presidencies, with uh, regulators and line ministries, et cetera, even, even government-owned um, utilities, et cetera. So what are they looking at in 20 years hence? And they can't answer that. They, they know that population is going to double. Uh, but really, they should be targeting a 4x in GDP and, and pitching infrastructure according to that. And that also means, you know, in, in, in planning their urban versus rural uh, dynamic, which is what, what uh, Patrick spoke to, um, that is going to be key in this. So, so the idea is to bring that together. When we, when we have uh, what I'll call a, a, a public to private or private to public advocacy session, to have actual live projects as part of that discussion is, is, is going to be pretty key. Whatever stage they are at. Great. Um, I had, Carl, are we still in like a Q&A type of period or, or what? Can I ask yeah, a question? Yeah, I mean, sorry. Uh, I just I just got a message from, from Kenneth. Uh, I know that his inter internet connection is a little rough, but um, he was telling me that he and Fiona were, um, were kind of discussing um, some all alternative financing uh, options through land-based revenue. I, I don't want to call you out, uh, uh, Fiona and Kenneth, but I mean, if you guys were, were interested in discussing that, that'd be great. 
Um, we do have a few more minutes left, and then I know we have a couple of announcements that we'd like to get to, um, but I don't want to keep everyone uh, too long here. Are you you're requesting Fiona or Kenneth to ask their question? If, if, they're, if they are interested. Can I? Can I, can I uh, this can I can I say something? Um, I've listened to the discussions. They are very educative. But there are things about Africa that when we started the project, um, we realized we have to do it a little differently. You know, if you want to build new cities, a uh, new city in Africa, like what you said, you have to, you have to draw, you have to draw population, existing populations to the city. So you need infrastructure. That's the most important, most important thing. And we, we realized that um, what we were doing was not going to work if we don't intervene on the infrastructure. Uh, like what we're doing, we have we're taking concession of brown roads. One is two hundred kilometers. The other one is 161 kilometers. And we're building completely new green uh, road that is 86 kilometers. And once we do that, what we have done is that we have about 11 population centers into 90 minutes driving distance. And what we are talking about, economy of those places, we're bringing the economy into formal uh, reason of things we are, we are doing. Because most of those cities, have their own strength in one thing or the other. And um, the infrastructure, like uh, the AFIDA person is saying, is what we should really, 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 how do we deal with infrastructure? Um, outside the roads, we are building rail to the seaport. You know, we're building 14 kilometer rail to the seaport. Uh, those things are very capital intensive. They have to pay on their own. That, that's, they have to be projects that are viable on their own. And um, it takes time to really put them together, you know, financing internationally or locally, uh, because you have to do a lot of, a lot of talking, uh, essentially. So I think uh, new cities in Africa will work better if you can find a hub and use the existing cities as a spoke and create the things that draw people, agglomerate the, the cities, it will, work, it will work better that way. And that's essentially what we are doing in Nyimba. Now, what we did now, once we do those three routes, we have connected 11 states of Nigeria with captive population of 60 million. And it's between 90 minutes driving distance. It's just that it's this kilometer road that separated the whole thing. And um, you need the government because if you can't do it on your own, you have to get those concessions from the government, you know, to uh, build the roads and told them. Because if you don't do that, it's not really going to work. So I think um, we need to look at the things that are very specific to Africa. Um, maybe my own part of Africa, really, you know, essentially. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Darl. We appreciate that. Um, I, I think that, you know, there is a lot of um, unique focus that needs to be on the, the unique challenges of Africa. And then I think um, uh, it looks like maybe, Kenneth, you did want to say something or do you want to hold off on that? Looks like he's. Uh, I've shared it uh, on the text. Eh? I've texted it. So I think people can, we can uh, read through it. Eh? Great. Sounds good. Uh, in that case, I think, you know, we'll finish up with some uh, some final announcements here. I know, Curtis, you have something you'd like to, to talk about. Vivek, I don't know if you'd like to mention anything else. And of course, uh, Nicholas has something he'd like to discuss as well briefly. Um, yes, sir. 
I think I already talked about uh, Africa's new <clears throat> city summit in Kigali. Carl, was I supposed to talk about other things that I'm now forgetting? No, I, I think just uh, a reminder, we we sent out um, initial, initial save the dates uh, on uh, our Africa's new city summit, which will be in Kigali, Rwanda, November 8th, 16th to 18th. Um, we'll go ahead and send out more information as well once... Um, Ticketing uh, purchases open up, which will be in uh, early July, I believe. Um, Vivek, is there anything else you would like to? Um... Um, just before, sorry, Carl, before Vivek, you, what you said spurred something. Um, what we want to do with the New Cities Summit is have the programming be influenced and informed by the Next 50 Cities Coalition members, by you guys. Right. We this is a summit that wants to be oriented towards practitioners, what they need on the ground in order to get these things built in the real world. And so whether that's what whether that's each of you uh, emailing us when you come up with ideas for uh, different panel discussions, presentations, folks that you think would be great to invite to the summit, please let us know whether that's me or Carl or Mwanda. Um, we are getting together the programming right now. Some of you have been invited to come as as panelists and panel speakers, but uh, please let us know of other great folks that you think would have uh, some informative things to say. Um, so with that said, uh, uh, Vivek, I'll pass it to you. Thank you. So so I mean, you know, one is a question to Carl, I should perhaps you know, announce when the next call is to be. Um, we were timed out in terms of getting uh, Infrastructure, yes. <laughs> infrastructure folks involved in this one. We'd love to have more infrastructure. Our membership uh, actively participate, and I think Curtis, hope, hopefully, you picked up interest yesterday from our AGM. Um, exactly. The second thing is, we are running uh, catapult accelerator generally, and <laughs> if it suits uh, Curtis and Carl and others at, at CCI. Um, we can share, you know, we're open to requests for from specific projects as, you know, the gentleman from EECD, for example, if you have a real project that's looking for capital, if you, if you have a roads project or a power project that's looking for capital, uh, we could invite you to present in the ongoing catapult for infrastructure in any event. Uh, so, so that's an offer that's open. Uh, should you wish to take it up. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. And, you know, finally, I guess uh, Kenneth had, had left his comment in the chat. Um, he, he said that the biggest resource uh, cities uh, globally have is land, um, which they either, you know, own or control, and that capturing and accruing land values resulting from infrastructure investment and policy decisions um, is is very valuable to, um, to uh, cities globally. And, you know, we agree completely. Um, and you know we we'd love to continue pr to promote conversation around that. Um, Nicholas, you uh, you have an announcement you'd like to make? Yeah, sure. So um, we're also doing an event on Zanzibar on July twenty to twenty three, so fairly soon. So the Chartered Cities Institute, Curtis is involved. I believe you're on site right now in Fumba Town, right? Yeah. So and there's another a second project. So we uh, that's called Eat Free Flow Eden. Right, so there's going to be two free zones in Zanzibar, one charter city, Fumba Town, and the other one, a free zone focused on building like the infrastructure for a new internet, also some regenerative agriculture and things like that. So we want to spend four days there to explore the project. We're also going to spend a full day in Fumba Town. Right, and we also, sorry about the dog, bring several people from the Zuzalu, from the Ethereum community, to explore it as well. So there'll be some sort of crypto and tech people. Ambition is also to invite as many African technology and crypto startups as possible. So we've made a huge outreach to the tech community in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam. So we'd love for you to come, right? So we want to bring together city builders and technology startups, VCs, people from the crypto community. And we also have as a um, sort of some, we also bring in some local artists to do an exhibition. So. Would love any one of you to join for that as well. I'll leave it to link in the in the comments. And uh, I will um, follow up uh, with an email for everyone 
um, that will include relevant links um, both to uh, the information regarding um, the CCINUC summit as, as well as uh, Nicholas's event uh, in Zanzibar. Um, if there are no further questions, um, it's been a great discussion. Chris has a question. I will well, say before he asks his question that we will have another um, event uh, for another digital rounds table in August. Um, I think we are going to start doing digital rounds tables that are oriented um, thematically. Um, so in this case, um, we do have today with us three new city projects represented, I believe. Um, so we have Itana, we have Nyimba, uh, and then we also have um, uh, Gabriel King City. Um, all of these projects sort of have a, an initial anchor tenant um, that is different um, from the others. And um, we'd like to sort of drill down on the specific issues that relate to um, the development of cities around those issues. Um, so we will have another uh, digital rounds table in August, and I, I believe another one in October prior to um, our conference. Curtis, you have something you'd like to say? That, that was it. I was just going to say the, the next uh, round table dates, uh, I think August 30th, and then like you said, mid-October. So looking forward to seeing all of you there. And again, if you have in like you guys want to inform the theme themes and topics chosen for these future roundtables, let us know what you think would be most useful and we'll get um, speakers or experts to speak to those themes. So thanks so much, everyone. Um, one, one thing though, Carl, thank you for doing this. This is amazing. It's, it's awesome. Um, Patrick, um, your presentation was very insightful. Are, are you able to share that? Is that yeah, something we can and I, I will have access to? I will send it in the follow-up email that I send out. Um, I'll probably, based on based on the timing, the way things are, I'll probably send the follow-up email out later, either tonight for me, my time, or um, otherwise um, on on Monday. Um, also, look forward to an email regarding the um, the quarterly newsletter for the next fifty cities coalition. If you're not yet a member of the coalition, I encourage you all to join. Um, thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you.